Great God, thank you that we can come to you just as we are. Lord, thank you for this time of worship where we have been in your presence so far. Father, as we go into the word, may we hear your story. May we hear your word. And Lord, help me to not hinder your process. Thank you, God. We love you. Amen. Please be seated. Okay, so today we are definitely celebrating our graduates. Do I need to do anything? There we are, okay. So we're celebrating our graduates. University, grade 12, grade nine, kindergarten, whatever it is that you're graduating, you have just passed a milestone. Uh, there's other sorts of milestones. I heard that one of our family here is celebrating a 90th birthday. Is that you, Mabel? Congratulations, milestone. Okay, so where does this milestone concept come from? It's saying something significant has happened and we are marking it for time immemorial. Milestones first came about in the 300s BC when the Romans were in power and they were building these big roads, every, roads everywhere and so that people would know how far they had come from the city and how far they had to go to the next city, every 1,000 double paces they would stick a stone monument in the ground with that information written on it. It was something visible where they were able to rec record where they were in their journey, they could work out where they were going and what direction. Graduation is a milestone. For all of those who've already had their graduation service, how many of you had photos taken? Yeah, everybody took photos. Those who are still coming up for graduation this coming week at PAA, all of these beautiful people who are up here, Photos, guarantee, lots of them. We take photos, there's cards, there's gifts, there's parties, there's all sorts of things that are happening and visible mementos that we can hold on to, to say, yes, we have achieved, we have accomplished. And so we celebrate with you, your accomplishments. You have done what it took to get what you wanted. Accomplishing a goal does not mark the end of the journey. It marks the beginning of the next part. So we celebrate what has happened up to this point and we celebrate that which is yet to come. Where is the journey of life taking you now? Are you celebrating about the new direction that you're heading? And what is the direction that your life is taking you? The grade nines, you're going into grade 10. Grade 12s are going into university or into the workforce. Those graduating from university are really hoping they're going into the workforce. Do you have a plan in place? Do you know where you're going and what the steps are? Have you mapped out what's happening next? I was the sort of kid who mapped it out. When I was in grade nine, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I was gonna be a teacher, a high school teacher. And when I got to grade 12, that plan had not changed. I was going to be a high school teacher. So, grade 12, I turned 17 one month before I finished grade 12. I was at boarding school in New Zealand. I'm an Aussie, but when I had come to the Lord in grade 11, I had been really, really convicted of the nearness of the Lord's return. And so even though there was still a whole term of grade 11 yet to go, I dropped out of school so I could go and share Jesus with people. I was a strange child. Um, Jesus didn't come back when I thought he was. And I realized I need to finish my education. I didn't want to repeat grade 11. I'd already done two out of three terms. And you know, I didn't want to repeat. And then I found out that in New Zealand, their education system was very similar, but different enough that I could go immediately into sixth form, which was the equivalent of grade 12. And I wouldn't have to repeat grade 11. So I went to boarding school in New Zealand and it was my first year in a Seventh-day Adventist school and it was so exciting. I just loved it. Okay, so nearing the end of the school year, I went to the office and I got an application form for Avondale College, uh, which is Australia's equivalent to Berman. And uh, I filled in the form, sent it off, 
secondary education, major in history, minor in English. Or it could have been the other way around. It was a long time ago. Okay, so we had about a month or so left to go in school. And um, at the end of the school year, it was like here in Canada, where you have diplomas, great big external exams that every grade 12 student in the country sits. And the last week of school, I was not well. And so when I got a little bit better, I started going around to all my teachers to catch up on whatever work that I had missed out on, because I had to study for my exams. And I left the Bible teacher for last, A, because there's no external Bible exam, and B, he was my favorite teacher. It was my favorite subject. Leave the best to last. So I'm sitting there, and when we'd finished our conversation, he says to me, so honey, what are you going to do next year? And I said, theology. And he just sat there, silent, for a little bit, and he went, cool. Unexpected, but cool. And I said, what is theology? <laughs> I've never heard that word. And he went, ho, oh. ho, ho. He said, it means to be a minister, a pastor. I said, no, no, I'm going to be a high school teacher. I have no desire to be a high school teacher. He said, honey, I think you need to go away and pray about that. God might have some other ideas. I prayed. I fasted and prayed for three days. I was not studying for my big exams, which were in only a week's time. I needed to find out what God wanted me to do. And after three days of fasting and prayer, I came up with a plan. I would do a Gideon. I would put a fleece before the Lord and I would ask him for the absolute impossible so that he could show me beyond a shadow of a doubt that he wanted me to do theology. And if he didn't do the impossible, then I would sit the exams and very happily go on my way being a teacher. That would be fine. <sighs> he did the impossible. I had to do theology. I was not a happy camper. Now, I can hear some of you saying, but what was the fleece? Was it really impossible? Or did you sort of rig it some way? Because I know some people pray that way. Okay, so over there, the school year goes from January to the end of November. December was a holiday. Um, and in grade 12 in New Zealand at that time, every grade 12 student in August had to sit what were called trial exams. They were past diploma exams. And we had a whole week, it was a trial, just as if it was the actual diplomas. And at the, I was just about to start the exam, so the exams were due to start on the Monday. The Saturday before, I got a phone call from the airline telling me that they were still trying to get me on the first possible flight home. And I asked why they were doing that. And they said, well, we got a message, something about your dad being really ill. Do we stop doing this? I said, no, no, keep, keep trying to get me on the first possible flight. Um, and we hung up and then I immediately rang home. I rang Australia. And my little brother answered the phone and I asked to speak to mum. And he said, no, mum's at the hospital. I said, why is mum at the hospital? And he said, because dad's in hospital. I said, why is dad in hospital? Little brothers. Um, he said, he's bleeding. I said, where is he bleeding? Between the brain and the skull. I thought, okay, thanks darling. I'll talk to you later. And I hung up. And just after I hung up, the airlines rang me back and they said they'd managed to get me on a flight on Tuesday morning. I said, okay. And so on the Sunday and the Monday, I sat five diploma exams, back to back, boom, 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 boom. And then Tuesday morning, hopped on the plane, went home. I got home with a couple of days grace. I saw my dad for a couple of days before he died. So I was 16 when he died. Um, so the trial exams, I didn't do so well. I got back to school, I got my results. I had failed four out of the five exams because I'm a last minute studier and there had been no time to study. Um, and the one that I passed, I got a whopping 57%, woohoo. So in those days, what they used to do was in the trial exams, they would send the results of every grade 12 student to Wellington and there was a computer in Wellington and it would rank order all of the results and the top 20% would get what's called accredited they didn't have to sit the diplomas because it was assumed that they would have passed anyway. 
and the other 80% had to sit the diplomas. So, what was my fleece? Lord, you get me accredited and I'll know you want me to do theology. Because there was no way the computer was gonna say I was in the top 20% of the country. I started studying really hard for my exams. I had half a week left to study and um, we didn't find out if we were accredited until a couple of days before the exams began. So they would call all the grade 12 students into a room on the one day in each of their schools and hand out an envelope. And in the envelope was either your accreditation certificate or your exam slip with your number that you had to take with you to every exam. And uh, I got accredited. God wanted me to do theology. Not happy. Okay, but I got with the program. That day, when I went to visit my teachers, I was going about my day, catching up on my work, getting ready for exams. It was just another ordinary day like any other day. And then God put the word theology in my mouth and my world turned upside down. Like large doors, great life-changing events can swing on very small hinges. It was just another day when Moses went out to care for his sheep, but on that day he heard the Lord's call and he became a prophet. It was just another day when David was called home from looking after the sheep and he was anointed king. It was just another day when Peter and Andrew and James and John were sitting there fishing, not fishing, mending their nets after a night of failed fishing. And Jesus came along and called them to be fishers of men. You never know what God has in store for you. Even in commonplace conversations with a friend or a relative or a teacher. So keep your heart open for the providential leading of God. You just never know when it's going to show up. So what is your dream for your future? What is the focus of your dream? And does your dream for the future hinge on God's dream for your future? Are you seeking God and wanting to know his will for your life? Are you determined to live God's dream for your life? Or are you determined to live your own dream? When I was 15, so grade 11, I'd just come to the Lord. I would daydream. I'm not sure that's a good thing to confess. But I used to daydream, fantasize, you know. My fantasies were about going to the other side of the world and sharing Jesus with people. And I would think about England or India or, you know, somewhere in the Northern Hemisphere and share Jesus with people. When I was 35, we moved from Australia to Canada. And I share Jesus with people. 20 years later, that fantasy became a reality. What is the dream that Jesus has given you? And do you have a clear picture of that dream? Are you determined to do what God has called you to do? I had a dream to work as a pastor. I told you I got with the program. I finally got on board. God gave me that dream in 1978. In 1999, I started work as a pastor. 21 years later, the dream became a reality. Now, don't get too discouraged. I'm not saying that it takes 20 or 21 years for dreams to become reality. Okay, so they, they can happen much quicker than that. Remember, I had a dream of being a high school teacher. When I finished my theology degree, there was no hope of getting a job in ministry because there were no women in ministry back then, um, and certainly not in Australia. Oh, guess what? God got me a job as a high school teacher. Straight out of college. It was so good. I taught religious studies full time at one of our Seventh-day Adventist high schools in Sydney in Australia. And I loved it. I didn't know the job existed. I didn't apply for it. I didn't interview for it. It was given to me. And I thought, thank you, God. It was so good. I loved it. Okay, he called me to do theology at a time when women did not do theology. He asked me to let go of my dream of being a high school teacher 
and to obey his call to theology. I was determined to do what God wanted me to do, even if it wasn't what I wanted to do. And when I completed the degree, not only did he get me a job as a high school teacher, but then I got to teach my favorite subject as well, Bible. Like, I like history in English, but Bible rocks. Okay, so Nehemiah had a God-given dream to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. This story takes place right near the end of the Old Testament times. The Jews have been in captivity for the 70 years that Jeremiah said they would be, and then a contingent of about 50,000 left Babylon and went back to Jerusalem under Zerubbabel around about 536 around there when Cyrus gave the decree. About 80 years later, there was another group that went back, a much, much smaller group, went back to Jerusalem under Ezra. And now, 14 years after that, in about 444 BC, Nehemiah gets to lead a group back to Jerusalem to try and complete the job. Okay, so before he leaves, Nehemiah is living in Susa, the city of Susa. It's like the capital of the Persian Empire at the time. And he gets news that the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and that the gates have been burned. And this is devastating news for Nehemiah. He's really, really distressed about it. And he starts to weep. And in that distress, the first thing he does is pray. He gets really bad news. And the first thing he does is seek God. He wanted to know what God wanted him to do. And the Bible says he fasted and prayed many days. It was many days. It doesn't say this, but, you know, it gives this month and that month. He prayed for four months before he put things into action. He had a great job at the time. He had status. He had power. He had wealth. He had influence. And he was looking to let go of all of that so that he could do what God was calling him to do. Like Nehemiah, do we have a burden in our hearts to do whatever it is that God is calling us to do? Nehemiah chapter two and verse 12, what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. Can you hear the relationship there? My God, their family, they are close to each other. And he was listening to God and he knew what God's dream for his life was. And God's love compelled Nehemiah to action, to do God's will. Are we willing to sacrifice the safety and the comfort to do God's will? Are we patient in gathering facts and planning our work? Do we enlist the aid of others or do we just try and do it all ourselves? Nehemiah celebrated his life up to this point. It was a good life with great accomplishments and he celebrated the life that was coming. It would look really different. It would involve hardship, but he could still celebrate because he knew that he was doing God's will. Nehemiah was dedicated to knowing and obeying God. Knowing God, having faith in God, enabled him to have that dedication to be able to come up to the challenge and to finish the work that God was asking him to do. And there was a great celebration when the work was finished, when that milestone was accomplished. Graduates, as you move forward, to begin a new part of your journey, it will be hard. Studying and work becomes increasingly more difficult as we advance. And that's a good thing. We can rejoice and celebrate that God has given us the ability to grow and learn and change and, and be able to do things that before would have been too hard for us to do. The idea that it's going to be hard is not one that you hear on social media. Social media today tells us that life should be comfortable. It should be safe. Everything is about safety. We can't have anything scary and, and it has to be comfortable. Well, people, it's not the message in the Bible. The Bible's realistic. God is honest and he gives us a heads up. He says, bad things happen in this world. It's a tough place to live. We live in a sin-filled world and bad stuff happens. 
But in the midst of that, we get to choose whether we go through the hard stuff with God by our side, helping us, or whether we go through the hard stuff all alone. Our choice. And the decisions that we make every day determine whether we are open to receive his strength and courage and peace and joy, or whether we are obtuse to his ever-present help in trouble. During the Last Supper, Jesus was preparing the disciples for the trauma that was to come. He knew the hard stuff was going to come and would just about overtake them. John chapter 16 and verse 33, Jesus says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. That verse tells me that we do not have peace because of a lack of trouble in our life. In the midst of trouble, we have peace because we are in Christ. Be in Christ. Make that choice. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 4, Paul tells us, I have spoken to you with great frankness, just like God. Messages up front are real. They're true. And then he goes on, I take great pride in you. I am greatly encouraged. So here he is, he is affirming and encouraging, he's reassuring, and catch what he finishes with. In all our troubles, my joy knows no bounds. We will have peace and joy in the thick of troubles and persecutions if we are walking with God in Christ, if we are living the dream that he has for our life. Seek God. Be determined to live the dream that he has for your life. This is not just for the graduates, it's for everybody every day, but particularly for the graduates as you are making decisions about direction and future. And we can do this. We can choose to make this decision because we know that God loves us without a shadow of a doubt. We know that he loves us and he is with us. One of my favorite passages is Romans chapter 8 verses 35 and 37 to 39. And when I was over at the grade 9 grad this week, this was one of the verses that was shared. I thought, yes! Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And that last one is 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58. Jesus does not call us to a safe and comfortable life. He does call us to a life of peace beyond understanding, joy complete and an abundant life. A life where we can celebrate and rejoice no matter what. Jesus didn't die to keep us safe. Hold on. Jesus died to make us dangerous, to storm the gates of hell. It is time to go all in for God. What would happen if each and every one of us, all of us, went all in, no holds barred, no limits, no hesitations, fully open to the Holy Spirit to be filled of him, compelled by the love of Christ to move forward and share Jesus in any and every opportunity that we can find, working with God in building the kingdom of heaven here on earth, looking forward to the second coming of Jesus. Nehemiah was focused on living God's dream for him. He went down in history as one of the greats of faith. He was determined to do what God called him to do. How did he know what God was calling him to do? He spent dedicated time in prayer. 
Day in, day out, for four months, he prayed. And then when he started activating his plan that God had given him, he kept praying. In the book of Nehemiah, a tiny little book, but there are 12 prayers represented, recorded in there. He starts with prayer, he finishes with prayer, and prayer happens all the way along. So ask yourself, is prayer your priority? Graduates, you are ending one segment of your life, of your journey, and we celebrate those accomplishments. You are beginning the next leg of your journey, and we celebrate with you the excitement and the joy of the things to come. And we encourage you, like Nehemiah, to make dedicated time of prayer, to spend time in God's presence, asking him, Lord, what do you want me to do with my life? What is your calling on my life? What is it that you are equipping me for to do in this world? And as you listen to God and make time to be in his presence, he will guide you. He will let you know. And that is the best thing any of us could ever do. The first step is to be who God calls you to be. For those who are going on and continuing in study, it is way easier to master knowledge and skills than it is to allow God to master you. I wanna make sure you caught that, so I'm gonna repeat it. It is way easier for you to master knowledge and skills than it is to allow God to master you. Surrender to him today. Determine to be his person. Let him be master of your life. God wants to bring each and every one of us to a place where he is more important to us than food. He is more important to us than Instagram or television or sports or games or anything else. We all place limits on God because of our own stuff. Experience God in his word and listen to the word the Lord has for you each day. Cry out to God for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. We've got to listen to him. Lord, take fear out of me. Lord, take apathy out of me. Whatever it is that's holding you back, ask God to take it away. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, give me strength and courage Give me peace. Fill me with passion for you and the mission that you have for my life. Lord, I want your love to compel me to action. Make me yours. Be my master. Go all in for God. How do we do this? Exodus chapter 14 and verse 13 tells me, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Hit the pause button. Be in awe of God's love for you, his gracious salvation. He loves you, whether you acknowledge him or not, whether you are following him and listening to him or not, he loves you and he never gives up on you. Be in awe of his grace, his salvation, and give him space in your heart and your mind. Ruth chapter three and verse 18, sit still until you know how the matter will turn out. Don't go rushing into things. Take time to pray, to be in the presence of the Lord. Seek God's will in all things. And Psalm 46.10, be still and know that I am God. So we stand still, we sit still, and we be still. And while we are in prayer, because all of those are about connecting with God, being in prayer, and while we're in that space, we are not wasting time. We are investing it. God is preparing both you and the circumstances so that his purposes will be accomplished. However, when the right time comes to act by faith, we better not delay. Because if we delay, we just might miss out on the best adventure of life possible that God has designed for us. 
So, what is the adventure that God has in store for you? He is faithful. He is love. He is God of peace, God of hope, God of patience, God of comfort, endurance, and encouragement. He is worthy to receive honor and glory and power and praise because he has demonstrated his love to us. And we know that there is nothing on earth that can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. He is trustworthy. Do you trust him with your life? Do not long for a life of safety and comfort. Long for a life lived in Christ. Eyes fixed on him, doing whatever he calls you to do. He designed you with a purpose in mind. When we do that, we will have peace beyond understanding. We will have joy complete and we will truly celebrate every step of the journey and the destination. So I implore you to be determined to live the dream God has for your life. And like Paul, you'll be able to say, my joy knows no bounds. Who today is willing to commit to making today the start of their most amazing adventure in God yet by connecting with him intentionally and honestly. If this is in your heart, please raise your hand. Yes, thank you. Graduates and everyone, milestone or not, I implore you to be determined to live the dream God has for your life. So with that in mind, what I would like to do now is invite all of the graduates. If you've graduated this year from university, grade 12, about to grade nine, kindergarten, come on up and I wanna pray for you. Okay, so these are graduates. All right, come closer, gather around me. I just want to pray for you. All right. Great God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are awesome and almighty. You create the universe. You hold the stars and the planets in place, and not one of them is missing because of your mighty power. And yet you know the exact number of hairs on each head that is up here. You know us better than we know ourselves. You have designed us and equipped us to a certain path, a walk with you. Lord, our prayer for these graduates is that each one of them will hear your still small voice will hear the Holy Spirit as he shares with them the way that you would have them go in their lives. Lord, we consecrate them to you. We put them in your hands and we pray for you to be free to do your will in their lives. If there's something holding them back from being fully open to you, Lord, please reveal to them what it is so that they can surrender it to you and just go where you lead. Father God, we pray that for each and every one of us, that every day we would go where you lead. Look after these precious graduates, God. Make them dangerous as they storm the gates of hell and build the kingdom. We pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you very much. You can go back now.